Hey folks, Michelle Perlman here, gastroenterologist and physician nutrition specialist. And I'm Amy Perlman, urologist, men's health and sexual medicine specialist. Welcome to Perlman MD's podcast. We are going to tackle all topics related to nutrition, sexual health, exercise, and mindfulness. Stay tuned. Oh, hey there, Amy Perlman. How are you doing today? Uh, how are you? I'm doing just dandy. So well, I'm sure- both got a nice spray tan. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm Michelle Perlman, gastroenterologist and physician nutrition specialist. And I'm Amy Perlman, urologist, men's health and sexual medicine specialist. All right, Amo Perlmano, what is the topic of discussion on this lovely Saturday afternoon? So it's almost May and with May comes graduation of various types and let's see what else happens in May, prom, different types of dances, right? So people are always looking for fad diets. I remember Michelle, when we were growing up, there was like homecoming and you wanted to look nice in your like striped dress. And so you did like a juice cleanse for a couple of days leading up until like homecoming dance. So people are interested in fad diets, you know, regardless of the month of the year, it's, it's, you know, 12 months a year. What are the common fad diets? You name it, I've actually done it. I've done the (laughs) cabbage soup diet. I've done like this three-day juice cleanse. It was actually right before a cruise in which I think I gained then 10 pounds on the cruise. Um, I've done Adkins. I've done Weight Watchers. I've done, I have not done the cookie diet. And I actually have not done the parasite diet. So there's actually people who used to, there used to be capsules that contain parasites and they would actually take these capsules. And when you take in the parasites, it basically causes this malabsorption condition where you can actually lose weight because you have a lot of diarrhea because the parasites basically take all your nutrients. So it's kind of like a glorified, I guess, gastric bypass with the malabsorption. They even have what's called the sleeping beauty diet where people used to take um, basically narcotics or sleep and sleeping pills over the weekend so that they'd sleep the whole weekend so that they wouldn't eat. So people are desperate. People want to lose weight. And there's a lot of trendy things out there because they offer very a variety of claims. Quick weight loss, um, but they're often very restrictive. And that's herein where the problem lies. Is there any fad diet that works long term? Because a lot of them work, right, initially. Exactly. A lot of them work initially because they're so restrictive that you end up not being able to eat all that much. And that forces you to really be mindful what you're eating, take out most of the foods that you enjoy. So a lot of people will lose a lot of weight. Oftentimes people may lose, let's say 10 pounds just in the first week. That's often just a lot of water weight. And then they may lose, you know, 20, 30 pounds in a month or two. But really a lot of that is water weight. And a lot of that is actually muscle. We oftentimes don't gain 30 pounds in a month or two. It is not normal nor natural to lose 20 to 30 pounds in a month. When you lose that much weight fast, you end up losing a lot of muscle. So Amy, why do you think it is that people lose a bunch of weight and then they end up gaining the weight back and then actually gain even more, this vicious fad diet cycle? Why do you think that is? Any clue? Um, It must have some way of resetting uh, our metabolism. Am I onto something there? Not quite. The issue is, is that when you lose all that muscle, That's the problem. Muscle is key to your metabolism. And even though you may lose 20 or 30 pounds in a month or two, you've lost lean tissue mass. And now your metabolism is slower because you have less muscle. And that's why when people start reintroducing their quote unquote normal foods again, they often gain the weight back and then actually a lot more. And then they, you know, find another diet and lose the weight. And then it's just this vicious cycle. So let's talk about maybe some of the ones that people maybe ask you about. So let's talk about the big ones here. So what, intermittent fasting, keto, and gluten-free. So Mm -hmm. when would someone actually need to be on a gluten-free diet in terms of actually improving their health? Gluten-free diets are critical for people who have wheat allergies or celiac disease. And that those two entities are actually very different things. A wheat allergy is an autoimmune condition 
where your body produces an IgE protein to wheat. Now that often will give you your classic IgE mediated allergic type symptoms. What are those symptoms? It would be things like hives, anaphylaxis, lip or mouth swelling. Those are kind of your common symptoms. Now, you can also have non-IgE mediated food allergies, and those are gonna give you much more nonspecific symptoms. That's where it gets challenging. When people have peanuts and they have anaphylaxis, it's pretty clear that relationship. But with these non-IgE mediated food allergies, you may just have a migraine, or you may have you know, a little bit of bloating or diarrhea or abdominal pain. It's often much less obvious. Um, so wheat allergies are one reason that people need to be strictly gluten-free. The other one is celiac disease. Celiac disease is another autoimmune condition. It's not really considered an allergy, actually. And that's when your body makes antibodies to gluten. Amy, what is gluten? Someone hasn't been paying attention to my prior webinars. It makes uh, food taste good. <laughs> and it's a, a protein. Oh my goodness, oh. we finally learned something. I'm so excited. My own twin sister listens to what I have to say at least part of the time. So gluten is a protein and it's in foods that contain wheat, rye, and barley. It uh, um, contributes to the elasticity and distensibility of a product. So if you were to eat gluten-free bread, it often tastes like cardboard and no one's gonna spend $10 on a loaf of cardboard. So these food manufacturers often have to add added sugar and added fat in order to replace that consistency and make it more palatable. So when people go on these gluten-free diets, whether or not they need to or not, a lot of times people end up buying the processed gluten-free foods. When you actually compare the nutrients and the, and the, the macronutrients and the ingredients of gluten-containing bread versus uh, gluten-free bread, the gluten-free bread often has more calories, more carbs, and more fat. So if you are going gluten-free, for whatever reason that is, you just have to realize it's not necessarily healthier if you're eating those gluten-free products. Now, it's also way more expensive unless you actually need it, right? Exactly, exactly. So it's all, you know, it's all about moderation. If you have, whether it's a whole loaf of gluten-free bread or a whole loaf of gluten-containing bread, neither of them are really healthy. Neither of those are really considered in moderation. So that's the whole gluten-free um, kind of diet trend. If you remove all gluten and you just, let's say you just take out you know, bread and pasta, you may lose weight if you're not eating the processed stuff. So that's really the key differentiation. So how did the gluten-free craze get so popular? So Grain Brain, Wheat Belly, they were bestseller books, and they basically blamed a lot of the common ailments that people have, whether it's you know a, a bloated belly or brain fog or rashes or heart disease. Um, these books came out, and they were very trendy, and we said, okay, maybe it's all related to gluten, um, when in fact there are so many other factors that are contributing to a lot of these chronic illnesses. But people get these books and they buy into these fad diets because they're desperate. They want to feel better. So if they see a headline that says, you know, how are you going to sleep better? And how are you going to get rid of your migraines and feel better and lose weight? Go gluten-free, buy my book. Then that's a very tempting sort of sell. Mm, okay, so let's talk about the keto diet because that's been all the rage. Uh, what are common foods that people eat on the keto diet? Anything wrapped in bacon. I mean, it is ridiculous. <laughs> I have actually seen significantly elevated liver uh, lipid profiles, whether it's LDL or triglycerides, when people go on these keto diets. I think let's kind of backtrack here and talk about what exactly is a keto diet? A lot of people use that term because it's very trendy um, when they're not actually in ketosis. A keto diet is really where you're getting about 70% of your daily calories from fat. It, it is a low carb diet, but a lot of people get those two things confused. A lot of people think, okay, I'm gonna cut out the bread, the rice and the pasta. I'm gonna eat lean protein and veggies, like lower carb veggies, like spinach and broccoli, and I'll have a little bit of fruit in there, but I'm gonna come out the, uh, cut out the starchy items, and they say that's keto. Um, oftentimes it's not keto, it's just a low carb diet. So keto is really 70, about 70% 70 of your calories coming from fat. 
that can actually be quite difficult because a lot of your kind of healthier fatty items, whether it's avocado, like cashews, almonds, things like that, they also contain carbs. So if you eat enough of them, it will actually increase your carbs pretty significantly over the day. So in order for people to get high fat, low carbs, they're literally just eating high fat protein items. So that would be things like bacon, whole milk, creamer, um, a lot of like deli meat, salmon, which is obviously a good option, um, but it's really mixed with all these other things, butter, ghee, you name it, it's very heavy. Now, people often say that they feel less hungry. Why do you think that is? Because they're very high in calories. They're very high in calories, but because it's coming mostly from fat. So how does fat affect gastric emptying? When you compare all the different... It's gastric emptying. Exactly. Now, a lot of these things, like fiber and protein, it does slow gastric emptying. But your fat macronutrient actually has the largest role when it comes to slowing down gastric emptying. So when you have a high-fat meal, it slows down the rate at which your stomach empties, so it keeps you full longer. Now, what sort of GI symptoms then can people experience? When people end up having... 40 or 50 grams of fat in a meal, that means all that food is sitting in your stomach. If you were to have that late at night, you know, um, 800 calories worth of food, mostly fat, it's going to be sitting in your stomach. You lie down at night. Now, all that stuff in your stomach is likely to reflux into the back of your throat. Um, so although fat is important for delaying gastric emptying, if you don't do it right or if you have excess, it can actually lead to nausea and bloating and just not feeling well in some individuals. And while bacon tastes really good, I just imagine what bacon does to my arteries. I don't know. I just, even if it would allow me to lose weight, just like thinking about bacon irrespective of how good it tastes i just can't imagine anyone could convince me it's healthy for my body exactly <laughs> i mean when you look at the evidence a keto diet has really only shown to be beneficial in kids with epilepsy and i don't have a single patient in clinic who's a child with ep with epilepsy so we just don't have the data to support it and you know part of the issue here is that in order to stay in ketosis kind of long term and increase the variety bacon and all these other processed things are often the key components of the keto diet. Now, not everyone, you can do it in a healthier manner, but I'd say the majority of people probably don't do it that way. And even things like bacon and other processed meats like deli meat, they're actually considered by the World Health Organization as class one carcinogens. What does that mean? They are cancer causing. So as a physician, as a gastroenterologist, someone who has a background in nutrition, when people come to my clinic and say, doc, why can't I have bacon? It helped me lose weight. It's tasty. Why can't I have it? I just, I can't endorse it because I know the effects that it has on the body. At the end of the day, people are going to eat whatever they want to eat, but I go by the evidence. And if I know it can cause harm, plus it's extremely high in sodium, I just don't endorse foods like that. Yeah, and I remember you saying, and the research suggests this as well, is that colorectal cancer is more common than it's been, and in young people, right, in people even in their 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. Is that because of the food that we're eating that might include things like bacon and deli meat? Exactly. So when you look at the screening protocols for colorectal cancer, for decades and decades and decades, we started at the age of 50 unless you had increased risk like a family history or genetic uh, uh, issue. Um, nowadays, actually, the, proto or the screening guidelines, we actually start at the age of 45. Why is that? Well, our genetics have not changed that significantly over the past several decades. But Amy, what has changed over the last few decades? Our, our food. nutritional intake. Exactly, our food. Yeah. And so what's critical here is that although the food is not changing our genetic makeup, it actually influences the way that our genes are expressed. And so we are seeing metastatic colorectal cancer in younger people. Now when a young patient, even if they're 18, 25, or 30, if they have any rectal bleeding, even just blood with wiping, I go straight for a colonoscopy. We used to blame it on hemorrhoids, but now we just cannot do that. Wow, okay. 
Um, thank you for sharing that information. We always have to go back to food as being medicine or food as being poison. That really has everything to do with chronic disease and how we experience pain and weight loss, which is a lot of what you deal with, but it's way larger than weight loss. It's there are certain foods that cause cancer and there are certain foods that don't cause cancer. And so at the very basic level, if we want to feel well, we have to eat well. And like to go back and Amy, to and that's not just today, yeah. not just tomorrow, not next for the third, not for the you know next 30 days, like these whole 30 plans. That's forever. It's a consistent thing. And that's really what matters that if you want to feel well, you have to eat well consistently. It's not easy and it's not about being perfect all the time. It's about making better choices and making progress. Okay, so for people who let's say, you know, want to start now or continue some of the healthy habits they're having or, you know, drastically change what they're doing. Um, we like these fad diets because they tend to be easy and give us some good results. But what are some things that people could even do, you know, later today in terms of like cleaning out their pantries? So uh, if people want to get on the right track, what can they do today? What might they remove from their pantries or refrigerator or freezer? Yeah, I always start with three goals that we can start right away. And I tell people, start with goal number one. And if that takes you a few weeks to conquer before you move on to goal number two, that is totally fine. But none of my short-term goals are actually weight-related because although we have control over what we choose to eat, we don't have control whether I'm going to lose one pound this week or two pounds next week. So people often put so much pressure on losing a certain amount of weight per week. If you're consistent with these dietary changes, the weight will come off. But with hormonal changes, it will come off at whatever speed it wants to come off, whether you're on your period, you have stress, you didn't sleep a whole lot, you went out to eat and gained some water weight from all the sodium, it's going to vary. But you have more control over, you think, of the food that you put in your home and the food that you consume. So really the first start is making your home your safe place. If you know that if you have a huge jar of peanut butter and late at night when you're bored, you take a spoon and you eat the peanut butter out of the jar, you get rid of the peanut butter and you get little snack packs of peanut butter and you freeze the majority of them and you keep what's out one snack pack. You will, if you're really hungry, you'll eat frozen peanut butter, but you'll have to figure out how to get it out of the snack pack while it's still frozen. So you can still keep it at home, but the problem is, is that we make convenient, unhealthy food way too accessible. We, need to, we really need to put some, uh, make it an effort to make food sometimes because when things are just lying out and there's no preparation, it's so easy to just grow, go into the pantry when we're not actually hungry and start snacking. So buy snacks that actually take a little bit of effort so that when you go to the fridge, you actually have to ask yourself, am I really hungry where it's going to take me five to 10 minutes to cut up the cucumber and have it with the hummus? Or maybe I'm actually not that hungry. So making your home your safe place. So I want to add it. there real quick because you bring up so many great points is it's not about willpower. If you have cookies in the pantry, it's not like that we're weak and don't have willpower. It's that those are you know, sugar is an actual addiction, like cocaine or heroin. So it's putting too much pressure on us as people, yeah. as humans, to say no when, like, the goal of those foods are not to allow us to say no. They don't, the companies don't want us to grab just one cookie. They want us mm -hmm. to eat the entire package of cookies. So the only way to really set ourselves up and our family members who may also want to do better up for success is not to keep those things at home when we know they're going to be good and be our comfort foods. Exactly. But also telling yourself that if you want Oreos, don't keep them at home. But if you really want them, then you need to leave your home, go to a gas station or go to the a convenience store and you buy a single serving packet and you eat it and you don't bring more than a single serving packet back at home. That way, like you're going to have to really want it in order to leave your home, but don't buy a huge container because most people can't just have one serving. Yeah. And that has nothing to do with us. It has to do with our, how our brains respond to sugar. It just exactly biochemistry and, uh, and neurotransmitter response. Exactly. And then really choosing, um, items that have natural sugar and not artificial sweeteners or high fructose corn syrup. So a lot of people are going to crave sweet things like candy, but you can stock at home natural options like berries 
or you can do like cocoa roasted almonds or an apple with plain peanut butter. So there's a lot of things that will still um, satisfy your cravings, but give you natural sugar, a little bit of fat, fiber, and protein so that you don't feel like you're missing out. Like, you know, FOMO on the Oreos. There are plenty of other options to stock at home. Yeah, I think if you were to look in my fridge, it's kind of funny. I have like eggs and tofu and refrigerated dog food. So if I'm feeling hungry and I, I binge on tofu, I think I'll be okay. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so really creating that safe space and also, you know, being supportive of everyone else in the household. Um, really, some of my favorite patients are patients who actually bring their family members um, because they know that it's going to be, it's a family unit and that if one person wants to reach a certain goal, that everyone in the household needs to be on board. And so it's so amazing that if I can teach the mother or the father, then oftentimes whoever else is there, whether it's the grandmother or the child, everyone's going to benefit in learning how to eat better. Yeah. And you had mentioned on another um, kind of webinar that we did is we have to be honest with the people who live in our household in terms of what our goals are. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if someone brings home unhealthy food, that's going to be a temptation for the person who wants to change their eating habits. It's, it's really nice that person brought home cheesecake. But if it's going to distract that person from their goals, they're actually sabotaging that person and doing them a disservice. So what might be some of the words or the ways that someone, you know, sits down with a family member to say, hey, these are my goals, you know, what do you think we can do in terms of like cleaning up what we keep in our house? Yeah, I think just starting the conversation is so important. It's not about saying, you know, um, honey, you can't have cookies because I can't have cookies. You know, it's saying, honey, I have a problem when you're eating cookies in front of me while we're watching a movie. It really tempts me and, it, and it's making me struggle with staying on my nutrition plan. So do you mind that if you want your cookies, please don't eat it in front of me when we're together? You know, little things like that, that will really help them reach their goals, but not, you know, make the other person feel bad or not allow the other person to kind of do whatever they want to do. But it's, it's all about bringing up that conversation. Like I'm, you know, I'm trying to lose weight. I want to feel better. Do you mind, you know, just putting the chips in a pantry and don't telling me where they are? So I don't, you know, know where they are and that I'm not going to be tempted to eat them. So I'm not say hiding food, but making those types of foods that may trigger people less accessible. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we have, you know, I want to save some, some of this information in terms of other tips that people can do right now to maybe another session next weekend. Anything else you want to add today about uh, fad diets and the start of creating a safe place for people, especially in their homes? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is that nothing is off limits, um, but really creating that safe place at home and that if you want it, just get out of your home and get it and don't bring it back. And that really allows people where it's out of sight, out of mind is really a true phenomenon. If every time you walk by the pantry, the cookies are saying, eat me, eat me, it's going to make it 10 times harder for you. Um, so those are just some of my tips and tricks to create a safe place and stay on whatever nutritional plan you're on. Awesome. Rockstar status. Thank you so much, Michi P. Y'all have a great day. Thanks for tuning in. That's all, folks. I'm Amy Perlman. And I'm Michelle Perlman. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time. <laughs>